Your Creative Push, episode 341. We all have like a voice, whether we choose to call that like our instincts, intuition. It's almost like your ability to tap into your creativity or to like know what decisions to make is how well and how loud that voice is. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Danielle Clough. Danielle is an embroiderer from Cape Town, South Africa, and she comes on the show today to talk about trusting yourself and trusting what you love. She talks about her mindset when she made the decision to quit school and also when she made the decision to change career paths. She shares how we sometimes think too far into the future and put too much pressure on ourselves before, during, and after the creation process, and learning to trust our heart and our instincts when they tell us that things aren't right. She shares her biggest takeaways from the Red and Yellow School of Logic and Magic, I love that school name, uh, and seeing herself as a brand instead of an artist, and her work as a product as opposed to statements. She shares why she keeps her personal life out of her social media presence and the perfect formula for defeating imposter syndrome and also cultivating it. She shares her mental state when creating pieces that take longer than a month and how she often feels like she's the sum of the last thing that she created for better or for worse. And finally, she shares why she does not like the word inspiration and her advice for anybody that wants to get started or to start dabbling in embroidery. This was a powerful episode for me personally, and I'll get to that in the summary to share um, my story and why I took such a long break from the podcast and why I feel like a new Youngman Brown now. Your creative push is back full time, and I couldn't be more happy and more excited than to kick it off with Danielle Clough. Enjoy. Danielle, welcome to Your Creative Push. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Well, it's it's a pleasure to have you here. I've been looking at your work for quite some time now, and uh, actually the podcast has just kind of taken off after like a seven-month break, so I'm like super excited to to dive in and have you as like one of our first guests back. Getting back into the zone. Back into the zone, and I'm right in there. <laughs> so, nice. Um, I always like to give my guests the opportunity at the start of the podcast to sort of give like a brief bio and how you got to the point you are today, creatively speaking. Cool. So I'm Danielle Clough. I'm an embroiderer from Cape Town, South Africa. I've been living in South Africa for 32 years, 31 years. I'm 31 years old. And I kind of stumbled into the medium that I'm in at the moment, kind of through a sequence of like opportunities and mistakes. I guess I've always been creative. I just didn't really realize it when I was young. And my mom, she used to sew. So I get so so I guess like um, fabric and thread and it was always like a medium that was around me. So it just felt natural. It didn't really seem like a creative, arty thing. I went and I, at some point, decided that I was going to be the world's greatest fashion designer. <laughs> I was like, I was quite sure, like I was the next Coco Chanel of Fishhook, which is a very strange suburb. And I kind of started making my own clothes and they were really badly fitted, but I was like totally okay with it and like overly confident. And then I I dropped out of mainstream school, like a a regular kind of government matric, and I did an alternative matric in visual arts. So that like when I went to study fashion design, I had this practical advantage. And when I got to fashion school, I absolutely hated it. I just couldn't bring myself to keep going I kind of thought like oh I should stick it out for a year and then when I realized you as soon as you say you're going to stick something out it's probably like an indication that it's not right for you so I went and I studied art direction and graphic design at advertising uh, for uh, advertising school and then worked in a company um, in South Africa called Media 24 and just as an intern and also just kind of knew that it wasn't right for me and at about 26, I went back to like waitressing and hustling and I picked up photography along the way and I kind of tried my hand at like making a career out of photography and all the while kind of throughout this whole up and down and job and trying to find my my thing, 
I was like just doing um, embroidery and like playing with fabric and drawing on fabric with thread and kind of something that I, I picked up when I was studying. And then I just, it was just kind of always um, walked alongside me, if that makes sense. And then um, a few years ago, I would make these rackets and the, these embroideries on the rackets and they went viral. Within a few months, that just became my full-time job. And now it's my life. <laughs> that's, I don't know if that's a short bio or a long bio, but yeah, that's how I am where I am. That's a perfectly timed bio. Um, <laughs> and you. there's actually, there's a couple things I wanted to dig in into there because one of the things we talk about on the show a lot is that idea of whether you're going to school for something and you're, mm-hmm. you're, you get that feeling in your heart that maybe this isn't right or, yeah. or whether it's a career, like starting a job in something and you just have that feeling in the back of your head that, you know what, maybe this isn't exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Like you said, that that idea of sticking it out, we make this kind of conscious decision that, okay, well, I already made this decision and I'm bound by it. I need to at least see it through. Yeah. Um, so I was hoping maybe you could go back a little bit and talk about both in school and then that, that first career path that you ventured on, um, the mindset and then the decision – like the mindset to that you change. had yeah. during it, like to stick it out. And then like, what was it that finally led you to, to change? And uh, do you feel like you waited too long or do you think you gave it enough, enough of a, a college try as they say? Oh, I definitely didn't give it enough of a try. I was out of there in like three weeks. I think my, I told my mom oh, nice. I was happy and she was like, well, get out of there so we can get our money back. Like, if you want to leave, leave now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, it's pragmatic, I guess. But I think when I was studying, I, I did that like weird visual arts metric. It was actually kind of like this, uh, I don't know what it would be in the States, but it, it's like a technicon, like a technical school. And it was kind of like this dropout course. And to an outsider, or if you're like kind of, it was a big risk because it wasn't seen as a, as a good kind of school to be at. But I just felt like this is something that I had to do. But while I was there, I just did work. I just did. I mean, we did t- crazy things like potato printing and like, I, I just like things that are self making completely impractical in terms of living in the real world. But I loved it. And I like, I just had this like really deep feeling of like pure enjoyment and presence in where I was and what I was doing. And when I moved into to studying and doing the fashion design course and stuff, I just didn't have that feeling. And I kind of had an idea of how I would achieve that feeling, but it, it just never came into fruition. And it's such a it's such a difficult thing to do to kind of accept that you were wrong, but you have to follow that voice that's like, I know what it is to love what I do, and this is just not it. And you can apply that to a job, you can apply that to a romantic relationship, you can apply that to friendships, you know, like I know what a, a strong friendship looks like, and this is not it. And it's kind of like, then having the courage to trust that your instincts are right, even though your decision was wrong. And I think that's where I've, I've been very fortunate in a lot of respects because I have a very supportive family, even if they didn't like understand me or understand what I was doing or why I could come home with like a purple bowl cut. And my mom would be like, Oh, that's a uh, very you. <laughs> mm, okay. It's got a, it's got a lot of character. But, you know, it was never, it was never like um, criticism that came with it. And I think that kind of relentless support gave me maybe unwarranted confidence that, that you would be, that it's okay to make the wrong decision as long as you're moving forward. So like, okay, fashion design wasn't right for me. I know what it is to love what I do. And this is just not it. And, and I feel terrible that I was wrong, but I have to now change direction and make room for something that I love, you know, because and bring right. and create space to bring that back into my life. Because how you spend your time is really, is really valuable to, you know, your time is kind of like your greatest commodity. And then it's like, well, what do you do with that time? What do you, how are you going to put, does that make sense? 
It makes total sense. It, it is your greatest commodity. And I think the thing that people forget about is like the, the time that you do have, sometimes limited time, like when you have a busy life, but like the, the free mm-hmm. time that you do have, that's what you're defining as your life, basically. Like whether you're moving mm-hmm. towards something, like whether you're like, you know, maybe going to school or taking a class online or just getting to your work and kind of self-teaching yourself, your creative passion, uh, that, that's sort of you know, if you if you do that, you are an artist, like you are that thing. And you get to call yourself an artist. Um, but if you decide, you know, maybe that thing, you know, I, I've already started down the, this other path of, you know, doing this boring job, this boring office job, and I'm not getting to my creative passion. And it's too late, you know, like, I'm, yeah. I'm already telling myself that story. So instead, I'm going to use my free time to watch Netflix or not think about the the life that I could be living this other alternate dimension, you know, that I that where I'm living my best life. The time is all you have, like time is the only thing that you can do to kind of um, clock into your creative passion, you know? Yeah, and create, and create that world for yourself. I think though, though we do sometimes think um, if you project too far in the future and you're like, I should be painting, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, that can almost become so overwhelming that you don't just like, just do it. You know, like you just think like, oh, I have, I have this job, I have all of this stuff. I'm not, I'm like you say, I'm past it. I'm never going to have that. And you've created such a, a world around just a simple action of making or doing. And that's, and that, that, that bubble and that big world you create around yourself can be so limiting. And I think sometimes it's like almost that like uh, ignorance is bliss or like a certain naivety that you need to try cultivate. I'm just like, doesn't matter what this is going to become. It doesn't matter if this is a thing or if this isn't a thing, if this means I'm going to be the artist I want it to be, if this if this drawing is a success or a failure, but just the action of doing it is the thing that's going to grow. But you can't you can't like project too far in the future and you can't think too far back. You just have to have to make. I agree completely. And it and it what you just said boils down to like a project level too mm-hmm. of like so I, like about how long do um your embroideries take? Of anywhere from like four days to five, like five weeks. So it's uh, nothing. Nothing okay. is less than three days. Nothing. Okay, <laughs> so that, that's like the perfect example because you know doing something that if you want to start a new project and you're like, well, I won't be able to have like a, a complete project by the end of the day. Like, why even bother? Like, this yeah. won't get completed until like possibly next month. Like, ugh. So even boiling it down to that level, when you're you're not even sure what the final product is going to look like, and that's going to overwhelm you, yeah. it's like you have to find some so- solace in and some enjoyment in the the actual process of just being with yourself and and kind of taking it as a meditation and and just seeing the value in in just getting to the work and not worrying about that final product and not worrying about what it's, you know, if it's going to sell or where you're going to hang it or if it's going to okay. look like crap or if it's going to be a failure or if it's going to lead to like some big career move. Like, don't worry about that. Just find the enjoyment in, in doing it and then spending that time with yourself and your creativity. Completely. I mean, I, I think I think another thing that's, that's that shifted things so much is social media and then this kind of instant access to affirmation. So we want to like, we, we put so much pressure on ourselves to be productive and our value is connected to our productivity. And then our productivity is, is measured by our output and then the response. I've been such a victim of this before. I, I don't know if victim's the right word or culprit. Or, but making something or really thinking about how well it's going to go down on Instagram. Like, oh, I'm going to shoot this in a square format and people are going to love it. <laughs> And now I haven't mm-hmm. even started the project, but I'm <laughs> yeah. so busy thinking about like how it's going to be received. I'm not even involved in the process at all. And then when it's a dud, I'm really disappointed because I have no feedback and th- there's no, um, I, I haven't done it for myself. I haven't been like present in it. I haven't done it to see what I wanted to do. I haven't like a lot, given myself any space to be like fluid and go, Oh, this drawing sucks. Or like, I mean, ha- to, to even just have an idea, I was so, you know, so busy thinking about like, is this going to reach a thousand likes? If I get this and this, maybe it will help my algorithm, you know? And, and it's, um, 
that is a whole other world of anxiety that we create around ourselves and our expectations of like how our work needs to be engaged with instead of just going like yeah I feel like making a banana I feel like embroidering a banana because right I want to <laughs> You know, right. and if it's a dad, it goes into a shoebox, and you don't have all this guilt attached to it of like, oh, what a failure, you know? Right. Doing that, like having that expectation, thinking about taking pictures of it when it's done, or or how many likes it's going to get, or whether it's going to be a success. It's like burdening yourself with handcuffs, or like putting like a ball and chain on on your leg, and then you know, jumping in the ocean and wondering, like, why you're not able to swim while you're actually creating it. And then, you know, when it is a dud, wondering why you drown. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It makes it so difficult. And plus, then you're like creating for um, other people, which I think it's important to build your audience and and take their, their feedback and stuff. But at the end of the day, like, you really should be creating for yourself. And like, you're only going to really love whatever ends up coming out of your your creative time that you put in unless you are kind of doing it for yourself um, first and foremost. It's almost like you have a voice in your head. We all have like a voice, whether we choose to call that like our instincts, intuition, uh, whatever. It's almost like your ability to tap into your creativity or to like know what decisions to make is how well and how loud that voice is. And if you're making work for other people, you completely drown yourself out with other opinions and and so often very much like projected opinions so you go or assumed you go like oh they're gonna love this they're gonna this and this I'm, my audience are gonna people think that you know and often you're wrong because that's just your own assumptions and and you become so you can remove yourself so far from your own values and your own ideas and your own process and then and then essentially your growth and can wake up and go like hang on I've been embroidering avos for six months and i'm miserable and i don't know why you know right it's and i guess like like that um decision to to make a a move when it comes when it came to like school and night job and all of that was just having that that voice inside of me just being so loud and just being like oh, i cannot do this i don't want this this is my i'm really really unhappy this is just this can't be the answer I'm going I'm not too sure how I can change this but I have to change it and making you know quitting jobs or dropping out and just going and and as soon as you leave something it's not about not working it's actually about working harder to get past that that hurt that mistake I say in quotations as long as you don't stop working right and I think it is important to put it in quotes because it is yeah, like when we see it as a mistake, it, it makes us not want to either change it or it make makes us see it as like as that as a mistake and not maybe like a failed attempt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when yeah. a project doesn't work, it's not necessarily a mistake. It wasn't a waste of your time. I'm sure that you you learned something from a failed project or picking the the incorrect. I, I'm trying to think of like the most gentle way to say like not wrong, not incorrect, but just like not right at the moment. Uh, path can you walk us through that initial you know working harder um but then like what was your mindset like did you feel immediately that you made the correct decision or did you feel like you made the correct decision as far as uh starting on kind of the new fork of your life well when i when i dropped out of fashion design i was like so like wide-eyed like okay cool that was the first you know because i just finished school and now this was the first kind of like grown up thing I had done and 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 I I was essentially like wrong you know so I made this decision and I'm going to mention my mom again I'll try and make it the last time but I I was at home for about two weeks after studying and I was on the couch and she came home and, and she's like she's a working working mom and she was like listen I love you too much to resent you so I need you to pay rent and I was like okay that was like a hard wake up call like okay that's very nice <laughs> that you made the wrong decision and I'm sorry you feel sorry for yourself, but like get back into the world because this is just unfortunately not how it works, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was like something so minor. It was like 500 grand, I think, which is like the equivalent of like $40, you know, to, to stay. But I just, I had to do something. And then I kind of like started asking around, speaking to like some of my older like family friends who were in the creative industry. Like, what, what do you think? What's, what is even out there? 
outside of fashion because I was I was so tunnel visioned on this thing for about three or four years. So that's from like 14 to 18. That was like all I thought I was going to do and going to be, you know. And then I went and I, I had a bunch of like meetings, like kind of like conversations with people. And I just kind of, I realized when I was at fashion that the thing that I want, like it, it felt too direct. It felt like a little bit restrictive. It felt like very one-minded. And what I wanted to do was actually everything. I wanted to like conceptualize. I wanted to do design and this and that. So I was trying to find a way to just investigate and through like a process of elimination, find out how I wanted to like channel my energy. And I did a few internships. Um, my mom was very sweet. She was like, if you're doing an internship, you're learning. So I think that also that kind of what that built into me was that if you're learning, you're fine. If you're not learning, you pay. <laughs> like if you're living off other people and if you're living, then you, you work for it. And if you're like doing something in the realm of growth, then you get, you kind of get like a freebie, you get like a pass. So that was like a big part of my motivation was like, okay, if I'm learning, I've got to learn and keep going. And, and then um, I decided that like the best way for me to do everything was to do art direction and graphic design. It was difficult at first once I took that leap to kind of figure out what I had to do. And like when the world kind of came crashing in, it was like, you can't, you can't be placid. You can't just, you can't just lie back and feel sorry for yourself because you were wrong. You just have to do something to figure it out. Even if the next thing that you do is wrong, at least it's the process of elimination. So you're moving towards what's right. So yeah, and then and then I studied fashion, uh, art direction and graphic design, and I, and I loved it. And it was again that was like, okay, this is where I belong. That like that voice and like was loud enough to be like, okay, you're happy here. We're doing this. This is great. Let's throw let's throw everything in and trust it. Right on the show, we like to talk about art school, whether it's mm -hmm. right for people or not right for people. And one of the things I want to, uh, in this next leg of the, the podcast, explore is um, artists that, that did go to art school, um, maybe like one or two of the most important lessons that you learned from school. And that could be anything that not just creatively speaking, that could just be like mindset or just about life. Um, do you have any like things that when you think back to school, you're like, well, it was worth it for this reason or this reason? Well, um, the school that I studied at the art direction and graphic design is actually an advertising school. So <laughs> it's called Red and Yellow. It's like a uh, Red and Yellow School of Magic and Logic. It's like Hogwarts for advertising. And um, <laughs> the, it was it was really amazing. And the whole course, the three years that I was there, was very practical. So we would be given briefs, and they would be like based on a real brand, and we would come up with concepts and campaigns, and we would work with other people. So you would work with a copywriter, somebody studying copywriting, and somebody studying marketing, and sometimes even pitch to real companies. And I think the practicality of that felt so comforting and so good to me because it was like, it was just about doing and making. And it was like very, it felt very real world, if that makes sense. It wasn't like, it wasn't emotional. It wasn't based on like an opinion or on a history of what things were and what they should be. It was very much like, this is an idea. This is the way to execute it and, you know, and to present it. And now it's out into the world. And we got a lot of really hard feedback. It was like, oof, bad idea. That's really, that's, that's rubbish. And you're like, but I, and like, no, no, never going to work. And I think that that's the, you know, like building something in a very practical way and then being broken down and then rebuilding or being bolstered up was really nice because it, it kind of felt uh, quite real worldy. And I think that's, that's very like been a massive benefit to my career because everything to me now, especially I think with advertising, because I see myself essentially as a brand as opposed to an artist and my work as a product as opposed to statements or anything like that. So I think that that's been a massive, that was kind of like fed into how I work and how I create now. I'm quite practical about it as opposed to like emotional. So then how does that apply to what we were talking about before when when you're getting to the process of, of doing work, 
you know, creating and you want to create for yourself, but then you have all this knowledge of, you know, seeing yourself as a brand and then seeing your work as a product. How do you kind of walk that line where you're still creating for yourself, but with that end goal in mind of, you know, this is a product. I think it's about separating like the process for yourself and then how once you've decided, okay, this is now going to be in the world, then putting on like your pragmatism, hat of pragmatism and going, okay, I need to take photographs of this. I need this. How am I going to put my website together? Uh, is this along the, the, like the right tone? So kind of like keeping the, the process for myself and keeping and not making any promises outside of like what, what I know are my own limitations or what I know brings me joy or, or kind of creating a way that I know I'm going to make good work. So, so being quite precious about that side of it. And then once the work is made, almost putting it into the practical, into the practical world. So I, I'm, I'm very, very careful about the work that I take on. I always try to take on commissions that I think are in the right tone for the right people, for the right reasons. If I work with brands, it's usually, I, I've tried at least for the most part and been quite successful to make sure that the, I feel like the brands respect my voice as a creator. So, so kind of being quite precious about that, that side of stuff. So pr very precious about how the process looks, you know, and then applying like the practical side afterwards. And, I, and also I don't put too much of my personal life in social media. So that way, um, I, I give myself flexibility to change my mind and to change my tone. And, and, you know, I'm not too much like, um, I'm not as accessible as I think some other artists are. Good. Yeah. I think that's, it, it's good to kind of unveil the curtain sometimes, but it's also that it adds a lot more pressure to yourself. Totally. Yeah. And, and, it, and it gives you, if you, if you crack yourself open to the world, you kind of have to remain open. And I, I, I feel if I, if, I, if I keep a little bit to myself, then that gives me the flexibility to show what I want to and keep what I want to. Because I think when people have already have shared everything about their life, I've seen this with, with some, some really good friends of mine who are successful artists on social media and then how that kind of the, the, the tone of, okay, this is my personal life and this is my creative life and now they're very intertwined and now they, they have to remain intertwined. And then that pressure of like, well, now do I keep sharing these elements of my life that I don't know if I'm comfortable doing anymore? You kind of have to, because that's how you build your audience. Right. And not only that, but then once that door has been opened, it's hard to shut, like you said. And then not only are you worrying about sharing so much, but you're also maybe at the mercy of your audience for making real life decisions um, that mm -hmm. you, you know, might be the incorrect decision based off of what other people are going to think. Like instead exactly. of maybe it's a hard decision to make, like to, to change styles or to take a break or to, to quit and move to something else um, and maybe sticking in something too long, sticking it out um, yeah. for, your, for your audience instead of doing what is definitely right for yourself as a human being. Complete. And you know, again, sometimes you're just wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you've given, if you've shown every, all your cards to the world and then you're wrong, the feeling of failure that comes with that is so much greater because it's not just you beating yourself up. It's also you knowing that other people have witnessed this thing, you know? So it just, it's just, when it comes to your creative life, it's, that's one thing, but also then when you, when you inject your personal life, you, you essentially, at least in my experience, put a lot more pressure on yourself and how you received. And, and I think that's a, that's why. I like to just keep things a little bit distant because then the process is still is, is mine. And then my voice gets to be really loud in my head and I get to hear, oh, I don't like this. This isn't going well. Or, you know, oh, okay, this isn't, I'm not comfortable with doing this anymore. You, you know what I mean? So that, that just gives room for my own. It's, I'm the only voice in the, in my head. <laughs> yeah. I have many voices in my head, but hopefully they're all, they're all somewhat, young men <laughs> hopefully they're yeah, all some version of your own. But yeah. i'm with you <laughs> yeah so can we talk about the the actual embroidery you mentioned that it was kind of always something that was happening on the sideline so to speak is, is that fair to say yes yeah i i kind of discovered embroidery I, so I, I my mom taught me how to sew and i sew these clothes and then when i studied art direction and graphic design 
I was working at a gal. I used to make plush toys because the school was above a fabric store. So like the other students or my friends would draw these like monsters. And then we would go downstairs to the fabric store and we'd pick out a fabric and then I would make up these toys and then they would I know, gift them or keep them or whatever. And I would have like extra beer money or pizza or whatever, student money. And then I kind of doodled a rabbit on a piece of fabric once. I was in a gallery and I had nothing to work with. And I kind of, it was a way of like keeping myself entertained. And I just fell in love with this thing. I kind of thought I'd created it. Obviously I was, I didn't, but um, I just like absolutely loved it. And then kind of kept drawing with, and I would make these plush toys and I would draw details on the plush toys and draw on this fabric. And, and then it was always just something I did just, even when I had my job, I would do it. Or even when I was waitressing, it was kind of always a thing I did in front of the TV or on a Sunday or just to keep myself busy, I guess. And what do you mean you felt like it was something you created, but you didn't? Oh, I, I thought I had invented it. Invented embroidery? Yes. I called it thread sketching. Yes, I love it. I, thought it, I called it thread sketching. I was like, thread nobody sketching. has done this. <laughs> I've just drawn a rabbit on a piece of felt. I have thread sketched something. And I was like, I was I was quite sure I had like clocked into like this whole unique. And then obviously I was like, oh, I should buy different color threads. And I found it like embroidery section. I was like, oh, maybe I'm not the first. Call the presses. <laughs> <laughs> I've discovered it. <laughs> oh, that's cool though like i love that oh so arrogant but i mean it was just such a cool feeling to be like this is amazing like uncharted territory that's the that's the coolest thing and i think i think people can relate to that too whether like maybe not feeling like they invented something but like feeling like they stumbled into like yeah. what it's all about, at least for them. And that's such a great feeling. Um, and it does feel like you, it's like you invented magic. It's like yeah. you literally discovered like gold. Um, what was that like then when you dis- when you discovered that you didn't discover it? Was that disappointing to you? Did you feel – because I, I feel like at least in, in my life I have had those moments where I'll get an idea um, for something to write about. Inevitably, I don't end up writing it. And then like two months later, like I'll see it out in the world. And Liz yeah. Gilbert talks about that in her, in her book, Big Magic, how like ideas go from one person to another. Like if you don't yeah. like jump on that idea and create it, like it will move on to somebody else. It's like a living yeah. thing and somebody else will create it. But anyway, like did, did that kind of give you disappointment or like make you feel like, oh, well, this already exists. I'm not going to do it anymore. Or did it give you more motivation when you discovered that, oh, I didn't invent it actually? Well, I kind of, I did, I done the rabbits and then I got some extra threads and I had like these, this, all this fabric from the, the plush toys. So I kind of kept like evolving this drawing style. And then I got a hoop from the shop and then I used the hoop to make it easier. And I just kind of kept drawing with it. And then I got this inclination that there was embroidery around, but I just almost didn't want to engage. I was like, okay, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. But I'm, I'm doing some, I'm busy here, you know, don't show me. And I kept kind of, just building my own way of doing this thing. And people would sometimes send me links to other people's work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. But I don't want to see. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I wasn't dissuaded by the fact that it was in the world. I just was like, I'm I'm figuring something out here. And I don't want to be influenced. I don't want to feel bad about myself. I don't want to feel like I'm not very good. I just want to like enjoy this thing and see where it takes me. And I never put like, I never looked at it. Well, initially I didn't look at it and go like, this is going to be my life. I was just like, this is amazing. And it would be so cool if this was my life, but there's no, obviously there's no way that could happen. So it just felt like my little thing and I would just do it. I think also it was kind of like, I can be a bit competitive and I just didn't want to be competitive with this thing. I just wanted it to be mine for myself. So by removing, um, stimulation and other people other people's work it stopped it from going into my mind and filtering into the, what I created so then I felt very good about what I made even if the work wasn't good I knew it was like mine no what you just described is like the perfect like equation for defeating imposter syndrome I think just saying oh that's nice that's nice and just keeping your head down and just c- continuing to create 
because when when you look too long at Instagram or or you actually like spend days maybe researching to see if somebody else has done this or like it's like you're trying to find that excuse of not creating the the idea that you have in your head or on a bigger scale like developing your skills and becoming that artist um, exactly, because yeah. somebody else is already this this great of an artist like I'll never reach that level um, so I think that's like the perfect advice is just okay that's nice great I'm glad that exists and just keep your head down and do your own thing I, and I think also because my I had found this thing by mistake or thought I'd invented this thing so I kind of like had a different technique to what was around in terms of like traditional embroidery and I started this in about 20, 2010. So that was 10 years ago. It was when this, I stumbled into this thing. It was quite, it was a long time ago. So there weren't that many contemporary embroiderers around. So there wasn't that much influence outside of, um, outside of traditional embroidery. So even when I did see things or was shown things or, or I started noticing like things in shops and vintage shops and secondhand shops, it was very much traditional and didn't really appeal to or, or apply itself to my work. So it felt, it also felt quite separate. And because of that, I got more room to develop my own voice. Right. Happy decade now. So you said you started in 2010. <laughs> Happy, yay, double digits in oh, your uh, embroidery career. That's crazy. I didn't even realize it was so long ago. It's amazing yeah. how things kind of like just, um, excuse the pun, but like weave their way into your life, you know, and they kind of like, <laughs> so walk alongside you, you know, and that's kind of been in all these different like, scenes i guess in my in my life without me even realizing how long it's it's been yeah that, that's what it's all about though and that that's like we mentioned before like that's your life you're filling your time with the, that thing like it, it goes quickly <laughs> but it it like you said it weaves into into all aspects of your life yeah i i just wanted to say quickly on the imposter syndrome thing i i feel mm-hmm. like we uh kind of self-diagnose imposter syndrome. And then on top of already feeling bad about what we create, we feel bad that we feel like imposters. And I <laughs> yeah. actually think that there is something really valuable to that, the, that thought process of like, when you're like, oh, they're going to know that I'm not, I'm actually like, I don't know enough or that I'm not actually that good or I use drawing aids. or I mean, I, I feel, always feel so bad because I trace. I trace things and I use carbon paper. I'm just coloring in with thread, you know? And then when I say that, I'm like, I'm just coloring in people. Like, I'm cheating. But at the end of the day, like, that feeling often is what pushes you to be better. So when that feeling stops being, like, the enemy and you start turning it into, like, a cultivation, like, when you start to cultivate it into to being, like, a, a motivation to improve, like, I don't feel like I'm good enough. Like I can't draw from my mind. I can only draw with tracing. That's like a cue for me to be like, okay, you have got to practice drawing. If you want to be confident and comfortable in the fact that you draw, push it, just do it, you know, just don't let it limit you. Let it be a a guide into how you want to improve yourself. That's such a healthy outlook on imposter syndrome. And I, I agree it is a way for you to to see where you need to improve like when you do feel a little bit bad about yourself um and, and yeah like see it as that see it as a friend see it as a tracing paper for yourself <laughs> like yeah. as like a kind of a crutch until you can um develop those skills um but but first and foremost to not um let it stop you from from creating exactly it's like exercising it's like nobody really ever wants to exercise you know but you know you're going to be better for it. So it's like getting over that feeling of like, oh, I just don't want to, I'm not good, I'm not good, I'm not fit, I'm not going to, oh, it's going to suck, I'm going to be so bad at it, I like can only run up the road. It's like, okay, well, you know, I can only draw, I'm not good enough, I can't actually, and, oh, and the people are going to see me, and if they see my work, they're going to think, it's like you're not going to get better if you don't just get up. You're not going to improve creatively, you're not going to get fitter, you're not going to get healthier. Like, you know, it's just about like pushing through those those mental blocks and hurdles. Right, right, definitely. Well, it seems like you have a very good grasp on imposter syndrome, but are there any other uh, like resistances that rear their ugly head when, when you're creating? I think like a kind of like, I have a lot of guilt around productivity. So I feel like if I'm not producing, I'm not valuable. And I think within that, that guilt and that, that then you, you, you're creating from the wrong place. You end up making for the sake of making 
and drowning out like yourself and your own needs and maybe even like your mental health requirements at the time um, just for the sake of feeling like you are a valuable member of society because you've made something and you've put it on social media and you've put it into the world. Is that something that I grapple with quite a lot? Like it's okay if I don't sew today. I can go to bed before 12, you know, like not feeling like I have to, like forcing myself to be or not be something. And I think we either we either feel bad that we're not making and, and then we feel so guilty about that. At, or, you know what I mean? It's like we have like so many things mm-hmm. wrapped up in, in, in productivity and like, and then how it's received that we don't, we often like just like neglect like us ourselves as like regular humans. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It definitely is possible to work yourself into the ground <laughs> yeah. and to, to turn this thing that you loved into like a job and that that certainly happened to me a few months ago and that's why I needed to take a break you know because it felt like a job we talk about on the podcast all the time when it starts to feel like that you know you got to change it up and switch it up so it is kind of making that hard decision and and also mentally separating because if you're going to get paid for it there are going to be job elements there are going to be things that you don't like there are going to be like admin there is going to be days where you are going to have to paint when you don't want to paint and you know because that's that's how you sustain yourself like so there's also sometimes a separation that needs to happen in some parts and that can be quite difficult like this is uh what I enjoy this is what I don't enjoy this is the job part this is the love part and then kind of being like okay with and I think it's also about being mindful of like the benefits and the rewards of doing the part that you like and knowing okay I'm just getting through I have to get through the ugly bits to get to the good bits and like this is an ugly bit and just getting through that you know right right now that being said what does your process look like do you have like a a standard kind of process when it comes to making your embroideries or is it dependent on the idea or whether where it's coming from whether it's a, a job or whether it's just for you um yeah every everyone kind of varies there's usually like a a reference making process so whether that's like uh putting together images from the internet and then like editing it or painting it or creating like or tracing and and coloring in so creating some kind of like color reference that removes it from just being a flat photograph where i feel like it has to represent the photograph exactly i love taking my own reference photos so there's kind of like there is the the reference making part of the process and then the sewing depending on the surface is very much just kind of mapping out the reference and then coloring in with thread and then after that there's kind of, then there's the the wind down of making something it's like taking photographs putting it on on social media maybe making it available in my shop taking it to a scanner you know getting prints made so but every project varies so and i think that that's kind of how my brain is is why it I'm I'm kind of um ADD so like novel experiences and different experiences and kind of changing it up and not having a set routine is actually very valuable to me and to like the way that I thrive so I try bounce between different projects so I, I'll do a racket and then I'll do shoes and then I'll do a commission and, and that keeps me like stimulated and like loving the process and I think that's probably why I didn't enjoy having a, a full-time job and like, I just knew it was wrong. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of like listened to my needs, what I felt was right for me, what made me happy. And then built my life around my brain. Built your life around your brain. I like that. <laughs> well, and then when you say you jump from project to project art, do you have multiple projects going on at the same time that you're jumping back and forth from? Or are you going from like, say a racket, finishing it, then going to a shoe, finishing it and then moving to the next thing? Yeah, usually that way around. I do have a few big projects that kind of will sit and then I'll, I'll tap into when I when they I remember that I have them. Um, but for the most part, I like to just make something, finish it, make the next thing, finish it, make the next thing, finish it. I become quite like uh, compulsive and invested in that thing. Right. And it's usually like a new idea. So like I'll, I'll see something and I think I, it'll feel like a challenge, you know, like a new material or a different color or and then it'll kind of spark this, I, I'm very reluctant to say the word inspiration. It'll it'll spark the idea and then I, I've tried my best to like follow through with it. And then by the time I'm done with it, I'm like, I never, ever want to see pink fabric ever again. <laughs> and then I'll like jump to the next thing. 
<laughs> oh my god. Yeah, yeah. No, I I definitely get that where you just become inundated with pink and then you're just over it. Um, yeah. What uh, what does your emotion look like then when you you mentioned that like no project takes you know less than three days and some can take like upwards of a month or longer. Um, what is your like kind of emotional state during that um process? Like, you know, you said that it when it's a, like, it seems like a challenge. So you have like that kind of excitement to get mm -hmm. to it. Like how long does that excitement last? And then when it starts to disappear, what is your, <laughs> what's your mental state like? And then how do you kind of get through that project? Not great. <laughs> it's so funny. You ask us it. Nobody's ever asked me this. It's I'm like, I'm just smiling. I'm like, Oh no, he knows too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I, I it's, that excitement is amazing and especially with smaller projects and it's like a fresh idea like when it's like a pop culture reference usually that excitement will see me through the whole process mm -hmm. I, and I'll do like the big block areas and, and what I do is like the, the smaller details and the things that bring it to life like eyes the mouth the ears I'll leave till the end so I kind of like reward myself and that follows through that that kind of like excitement around the projects or a piece can lend itself all the way to the end. But that's usually if I found something that really excites me in terms of like an image, a material, when all the components fall into place. But when it comes to big jobs and big commissions and stuff that is like very time consuming and especially when there's a deadline, so I end up working for like 14 hours, five days straight, and I've just got Uber Eats and don't leave my house. And like I, I can become when those things happen, when it's, it's a job and I, you know, I'm super excited and usually very excited in the beginning. And then the bulk of the work, when it becomes essentially painful, it's, it's like, and I question all my life choices. Mm. That's the feeling. It's mm. like how I, I should know better. I should be better at my time management. I shouldn't have made it so big. I shouldn't have made it so this. I should have been, you know, so I end up being feeling very, I get very existential. And feeling very sorry for myself. So <laughs> that's that's kind of like the that's the, the ugly space. And then it's usually because I've made some, I've, I've pushed myself beyond my capabilities. And then once it's finished, I'm elated because I'm like, I can't believe I did that. I and I survived. And it's more than I, it's bigger and it's than I could have anticipated or than I've ever done it before. So. It's it's ugly, but usually at the end worth it. So yeah, so in retrospect, have you ever had that feeling of okay, maybe I did make it too big, or is it almost always that your initial instinct for what the end product should look like, whether it's size or um, you know colors or or you know fill in any of the blanks that that initial instinct is it almost always correct? Um, mostly yes, mostly. Mm -hmm. But but also I think I think I can't say that with full confidence because how my brain works is I make something and then I'm done and then I forget I, I almost forget I made it and it's like gone mm. and then I'm like I, I'm just very much like okay cool now what and I always feel like I'm the sum of the last thing I put together and I think sometimes that can be very detrimental because if I haven't made anything in a week I feel like I'm I have absolutely no worth. And I'm never going to, I'm not an artist. I'm not a creative. Who do I think I am? It's all going to fall apart. I'm never going to make rent. I'm like, I've lost it. <laughs> I've lost the ability to create. And then, you know, because I forget that I have this whole body of work and I've been doing this thing for years, but I literally feel like I am only as good as the banana I embroidered a week ago. <laughs> and then I'm like, who needs an embroidered banana? <laughs> no, I get it. I need an embroidered, embroidered banana for sure. No, I, I think that's like a good skill to have though. Like, yes, that's the detriment to it. Like when you have had like a lull or you are feeling guilty about output, but to be able to finish something and not bask in the amount of time that you just spent doing something and like kind of sit there and give yourself that excuse of, okay, well, I created this huge thing and I spent so much time doing this. Um, let me just bask in that and take vacation. Um, yeah. Just take a long break uh, and give yourself that out instead just being, okay, what's next? I think that 
again, touching back on that, keeping your head down and just be like, okay, cool, cool. Like it's like almost ignoring yourself yeah. <laughs> and like not wanting to be an imposter via yourself and be like, okay, all right, what, what next? And just move on to the next thing. I think it's very valuable. Yeah, it, it is definitely valuable for growth. Um, but I think, I think it comes from a place of like, also I came into this kind of, I, I, I worked for years in the uh, music industry as a, a VJ which is like a visual jockey. <laughs> oh, cool. Very cool. And yeah, I, I loved it. But I was, there was a handful of, of girls, females in the industry and majority are men. And you deal with a lot of like tech heavy kind of people. And I felt like there was a lot of like, and, and within the, like women, it was very competitive and there's a lot of machismo. And then you can kind of see there's like this, people have the, have like insane egos based on something that may have happened like five years ago. And not saying that that thing is invaluable, but it's also like, well, how are you today? Are you a good person today? Are you still working? It's like, do you do your work with kindness? Like, what is the kind of, and that, so it's always like the, the present moment is where I see like value. It's not, a, it's not like your accolades, it's not that your accolades aren't valuable, but that they're not the sum of, of who you are. The sum of who you are is, is the person standing in front of me, if that makes sense makes total sense I, I try to live by that as well yeah like what type of music were you vj for um a bunch of, i worked with a bunch of different artists i i did a, a traveling live show with an electronic producer called hazer and then i worked for festivals so i did some stuff for um rocking the daisies uh the alala some and then some international acts like the alalas and the black lips and so so i would just kind of and then i worked with a hip-hop collective called uppercut for years so very much like absolutely everything from like electronic to bands to yeah i have like a bajillion clips so it depends if a snoop dogg song comes on and it's just like rolling marijuana leaves and you know, i'm <laughs> yep, like locked yep. and loaded for anything <laughs> yeah very cool very cool yeah i make these um music videos called words plus music where i write to the to the music i've always um envisioned like uh -huh. that'd be cool if like this artist actually used it at a show or oh, something wow. like that um but i i have a lot of respect for for vjs i love you know edm yes but especially when i'm writing and stuff but yeah i love like i just i love zoning out to any visual stimuli so totally I, but you know that you were like the person that i was so nervous about because the thing that gave me comfort in that world was like, nobody's looking. <laughs> I'm just dating. Right. It's you just know? Like so background. Then I didn't get, Yeah, exactly. So I didn't get performance anxiety. I'm like, oh, no one's noticing. Missed the drop. That was badly timed. It's fine. Nobody cares. You know? No, I'm the guy that was actively waiting for it to line up. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody riding at the back. Young man is like, mm -mm, not impressed. Yep. 11, 15, <laughs> missed the drop. No, I'm sure you always nailed it. Um, but I was your <laughs> ideal audience. <laughs> <laughs> so er, earlier you mentioned that you were reluctant to say inspiration. Yes. What's that about? I feel like I feel like it's such an a kind of like unexplored incentive, non incentive, an unexplored kind of concept where people are like, "What inspires you?" And you're like, "Um, uh, uh." uh books I guess but inspiration to mm. me doesn't it's not like a one plus two formula so I can't say a book inspires me and stand up and open a book and then all of a sudden feel like I have an idea and I'm over, like and I'm excited and like it's, it's almost like this alignment of things that happen in your world it's like you smelt something and you saw something and you watched something last night and you opened the book and then you've got an idea and it's like this uh, flash of energy that kind of like comes over you and it's amazing, but it's not like the be all and end all of what it is to be a creative. And I think for, for me, it's almost like it feels lazy to lean in, onto inspiration as like the thing that makes an artist an artist or makes an artist good or is the driving force behind what makes an artist's career. It's like I'm inspired when I walk in the forest. I'm not always inspired when I walk in the forest. Sometimes when I'm in the forest, I have ideas. But the thing that is so important is, and the thing I think that's so much more important is like motivation mm. and drive and determination. And like, for example, earlier today, I was stuffing a pillow. <laughs> I like have these pillows that need to be restuffed. And I found all the stuffing that I have from these plush toys that I made. And I was like, oh, 
I really want to make a plush toy, like all with black fabric, and then just have a mask of like beautifully, uh, almost like realistically embroidered eyes. And I was like, and my friend Lani's got the most beautiful blue eyes. I'd love to do that. So I can't say stuffing a pillow has inspired me. It has. It has inspired me. But it was like, it's just maybe the music and all of that. But it doesn't mean that that thing that I've visioned in my head that, that this pillow fluff has just concocted, it doesn't mean anything until I get up one morning I maybe have free time and I go, cool, I'm going to do it and get a photograph of her. And do you know what I mean? That motivation to actually turn something into something tangible is so much more important to focus on. And such, it's, it, that's an incredible kind of resource that I think is way more important than that, like those neuron firings that happen for three seconds. Absolutely. Yeah, it's completely intangible inspiration and i think you you nailed it i think it is this this flash of neurons it's yeah it's like hitting flint against each other and like a spark will come out of it but it's it's up to you to like kind of like blow on the on the the whatever kind of kindling you have there to start the fire and then to like kind of maintain the fire like to keep putting wood in it but that that spark yeah. it's like you don't even really know where it comes from you, you need to be the one to, to get that like flash of inspiration, it, it's like you said, a combination of things. A lot of times it's like the music you're listening to. It's, you know, something that somebody says, it's something that has it's mm -hmm. maybe inspired you like a month ago. That's now just connecting with this other thing that you just heard, or it's, you know, waking up in a positive mindset as opposed to a, a negative mindset or just being in a happy yeah. mood. It's like all these intangible things that when somebody asks you, Oh, what inspired that? It's like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, this, this, this commercial for a mattress store came on TV and they said, it's something, yeah. you know, like it's impossible to quantify, but it's all Completely. about that, that motivation. I'm, I'm right. I'm right there with you. And, and I think, I think that that's something that I, uh, when people are struggling to create are, are like waiting for, so they're like waiting for the inspiration, waiting, waiting, waiting. And it's like focusing so hard. It's like focusing on those two rocks and you're like, you knock them together, you knock them together. But it's like if you don't have kindling, if you haven't like prepared it, if you're not ready, if you don't have your wood, those that spark isn't necessarily going to mean anything. And also, if you're just so focused and putting so much pressure on this thing to happen, it, it's there's a very like strong likelihood it doesn't happen. And then you feel bad about yourself, or oh, I had an idea and I and I I was going to do it and I didn't. Like you were saying with um, what did you say her name was Liz? But the ideas are going around. Big, uh, Liz Gilbert talks about that in, in Big Magic, yeah. Yes, yes. It's like, it's like the, that idea that you have is the inspiration. So what is it like? What is the driving force that's going to take that and to turn it into to something in front of you? Like that is so – like inspiration is beautiful. It is magic. It's like I, I've said this before. It's like when you hear your favorite song. And you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. <laughs> it like goes through your body. You're like, I love the song. And you're like, shoulders start moving, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's just that. It's just like that magic and that, that kind of like moment. But it's it's not, it just feels inflated, I think, and overly uh, glamorized. And I I think in, I think inspiration can take a back seat and just be that moment. And we should just like really start looking at like, Okay, cool. As creative people, like, what does it actually mean to do the work? Why do I do the work? Where, where do I do the work from? You know, what is that? What part of me do I need to cultivate to actually get this and put it into the world in a, in a way that is like true to myself, true to my values, is productive, is is um, is progressive? Like, you know what I mean? That to me is there's so much value in that. Absolutely, inspiration can take the back seat and let, just like let the motivation be the driver or as Stephen Pressfield and a lot of other people have said, just get your ass in the chair. And then like yeah. when, when the inspiration does come, when you get the, that spark, like you're ready to go and ready to kind of set it on fire. Yeah. And it's usually those, those moments happen when you are like in motion. So it's usually when you are like out in the world, taking yourself to a nursery that you haven't been to going a different route to work, like, going to a different coffee shop, uh, trying something else. So it's usually within a, like already moving in a, in a, in a new space. Does that like energy come in? So that, and that moving in a new way and like breaking your routine or breaking your kind of like, kind of like a repetitive headspace comes with 
a certain amount of work as well. So for somebody that's listening that maybe wants to try their hand at embroidery, um, I'm always trying to promote people to try different things. Who, who knows where it will lead or, or what other inspiration can come from it. Um, what would you suggest to somebody that maybe would want to try embroidery? Maybe they're inspired by your work. Maybe they want to um, give their hand at it, but they feel like the barrier to entry is too large. Um, what would you suggest to them? Um, I, I think I can do a shameless plug here. <laughs> um, For your kits? Well, I, I've, I've got a Skillshare class coming out, which is basics of embroidery and like, ways of of like taking your own references and stuff so so there's there's that but there are tons of online resources cool. like an incredible amount and so many people and you know what the, i think if you're interested in embroidery is go to a haberdashery the the craft community is so open and so welcoming and just ask questions it's like people are so keen to help you're like what do i what does a basic kit and there are lots of people who sell amazing kits online like emily ferris or uh, sarah k benning and you can just get a basic kit from them or just go to any haberdashery will have like a hoop a piece of fabric a needle and a thread so so the thing that i love about kind of the craft world and specifically embroidery is that you can be anywhere on the creative spectrum it's such an inclusive world so you could be following a pattern or you could be like just freestyling it and expressing, I don't know, your innermost desires, you know, through this medium. So so I think it's just about kind of like starting, going, getting the bare minimum, asking questions like what do I need or just Googling and then finding like a basic, just basic way of doing it and then just allowing yourself to explore that space because there, there is going to be a place for you to fit in the craft world and in the embroidery world and and it's like as long as the process brings you joy and and it will because there's so much room for you to find that specific place that fits you you're just going to keep building and keep getting better and and there, and then finding more questions and then you'll find more answers and and it'll just grow but I think the biggest thing is just kind of like if you're like mm, I don't know how to like literally that I don't know how to just go and ask someone because there's so many resources and so many people who are willing to help. Very cool. And we will link some of those in today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash Danielle Clough, C-L-O-U-G-H. But that being said, it is time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today. And just give them your best final ah. words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Find the part of the process that brings you joy and just build your work and your life around that. And within that joy, you'll develop your own style, you'll develop your own voice and and technique, and that will just keep growing. Just trust yourself and trust what you love. And that's this very simple thing of just joy. And with the confidence of just making something that you don't even have to share with anybody else, just for you, make yourself happy and allow that to just flourish and keep growing. And, and it, it will. It's max. Perfect. Danielle, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Pleasure. Um, for giving us that inspiration and for, for sharing your, your story. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been such a treat being here. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and for everybody listening, you can find Danielle on our website, daniellecluff.com. And on Instagram, she is fiance underscore Knowles. And again, we'll have that all linked up in today's show notes page at yourcreativepush.com slash Danielle Clough. Danielle, thanks again. Thank you. What an awesome conversation for Your Creative Push to come back to full time. So thankful to Danielle for coming on the show and so many takeaways from this episode. I hope that you got a lot of value from it, but the key takeaway for me and the thing that resonated with me so much was Danielle's insight about that voice inside of you. Call it instinct, call it intuition, call it your heart, but that voice inside of you and how closely it is tied to your creativity. And the thing about that voice is that it's actually able to be honed and it's super easy to hone it and to make it stronger. Are you ready? Listen to it. That's it. 
Just listen to it and trust it. We all know what that voice is, and sometimes uh, resistance disguises itself as that voice, as that voice of reason, when it's really just our doubts and our fears coming in. But the more often we listen to that deep-seated, in-our-gut feeling, that voice, uh, and act on it and do what it's telling us to do or not to do, uh, the easier it becomes in the future to know what we're supposed to do and to to realize that the decision is kind of already made and we're just going to be unhappy until we actually listen to it and actually take action on it. And for me personally, this came into play uh, seven or eight months ago when I decided to take the break uh, from the podcast that we've been on for a little while. Um, I hadn't been listening to that voice inside of me, inside my gut that was telling me that things weren't going right, that, um, that started to really bubble up and make me feel like a fraud. Then I started feeling like I was faking it um, because here I am, you know, the podcaster that is trying to motivate other people to push past these voices and, and the resistances. And uh, I myself needed to uh, step back and to take a break something wasn't right. And for me, I guess it was a combination of a lot of things, uh, some personal things, but also just feeling a bit burnout. And during that burnout feeling, trying to take little breaks along the way, uh, trying to, you know, do some best of episodes, trying to kind of fill in the gaps and get ahead of pace so that there wouldn't be a gap for you who I love and who I'm trying to help with this podcast. I have you in mind while I make this, while I have these conversations. So it was a really difficult line for me to walk both internally and, of course, externally um, to share that. I don't want to bum anybody out um, on a podcast that's trying to motivate you. So that's what transpired, and it eventually got to the point where the voices inside of me were telling me to quit the podcast. Like, why am I doing this podcast? I started to... um, not look forward to the conversations. I felt like I was phoning it in. I felt like I was faking it because I wasn't truly feeling motivated or happy to be doing it. So that's why I took the break. And I finally listened to the voice. Fortunately, I didn't listen to the resistance part of the voice that was telling me to just throw everything away and quit the podcast, Uh, but to take that break. And now I feel so good about the podcast. I feel so good about my own kind of journey, uh, being able to come back to the podcast. I'm coming back to it with a, a kind of a fresh perspective and that curiosity and that excitement that I had when I first started the podcast. So maybe for me in the future, uh, there will be another sort of vacation, maybe a month or two, uh, where I unapologetically take a break and work on myself and don't get burnt out and listen to that voice. Um, I promise to do that in the future. And uh, I ho- hopefully that will be motivating for you as well to take a break when you need it or to not take a break when that voice is telling you to go full throttle and, and put the pedal to the metal. You know what I'm saying? So again, a, a ton of takeaways from this episode, but that was one that resonated with me so much. And I am so glad and thankful for Danielle to uh, bring light to that powerful voice that's inside of us that we often forget to use as an asset uh, to help us on our creative journeys. On next week's episode, we have Dan Berry. Dan is a cartoonist, an illustrator, and a podcaster from the UK. And he is the host of the lovely podcast, Make It Then Tell Everybody, which you can find at makeitthentelleverybody.com. Uh, and you can also find Dan's work on his website, thingsbydan.co.uk. And he's on Twitter, Things by Dan. And of course, we'll have all of those places as well as everything we talked about today with Danielle at yourcreativepush.com slash 341. But that's all I've got for you today. So stoked. So very, very stoked to be back. Uh, and be back in your ears and hopefully motivating you with the help of my guests to crush it on your own creative journeys. But until next week, go create some amazing stuff and remember that the universe deserves your creativity and you are 
the universe. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.